Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be introducing the success study cases by Semade. I will share the talk with Tiago, my mate from Brazil. The idea is to show you about how that cycle is completed because we issue the alerts for them and they re broadcast them to the population. And as regards what was mentioned yesterday in terms of vulnerability and how to consider natural disasters and the human dimension and the possible impact of the event. So I'll be showing you very quickly this work was done by other groups, not by myself. As yesterday, this was a set of uh, things done by a group of people. So just to show you an example of the relevance of having those mapped risk areas and having information in those areas. So here we can see an example of an event that took place in Recife at the northeast of Brazil. And as you can see, it's a very generalized system. You can see the population in the region, over 600,000 inhabitants, and about population in subnormal dwellings, 100,000 people. And in that region, only some areas have uh, are considered risk areas. For instance, 18,000 in this area and over 14,000. From 101,000, it went down a bit. So we're reaching a more local level. So it's different to send out just an alert than to send an alert considering the points in which it is expected to have the more impact that is usually in settlements or abnormal dwellings. This was done between SEMADEM and the Statistics Brazilian Institute because they have all the info. We have part of the data and the rest is not published. The institute called IBGE is the one that has more data and share with us. So they have this database that are vulnerability indicators for this context. And by evaluating the people, we considered 183 variables recorded regarding people, gender, age, literacy, conditions of the housing, 135 variables for the houses, whether they have garbage collecting system, sewage system, power. All this information is taken under consideration by this institution that I mentioned. So part of the job was taking up the risk areas and crossing information. So here you can see this is Salvador Bahia City all in black here, all the city is at risk. And here you can zoom in and you can see the vulnerability operational index. And here is where you can see different colors, high, very high, medium, and the vulnerability index is the degree of vulnerability of those regions. So that's the first crossing of information. And as I said, this is our platform and that is included within the platform. We call it Salvar, our platform to save. So as to have all the information together in one plate and to see what's going on. Then we created a new area that we decided to call Batter that is a methodology that was developed by us. It's statistic territorial base of risk areas. I compiled this information, but I didn't do the job. So if you want to have more info, I'm happy to share with you the presentation. Now, yesterday, I had told you that these are the risk areas. And I told you that landslides is more than 7,000, but it's more areas for landslides. And this is a study 
that we're still conducting, still undergoing. And this is 872 municipalities. Remember, we monitored about 958. And the total risk area for those municipalities are 20. 1,060, including floods and landslides. So only that when they were created, those new bater, they dropped to 8,309 because they added some areas. So it was a certain methodology. And you can see here that here you have the areas that have risk areas in northeast and southeast that still work under the old methodology. Now, we were able to calculate the number of people that find themselves in risk areas. Right now, out of these 872, we have over 8 million people in risk areas. So it's many people, of course. And here, as you can see, the worst city of all, in terms of risk, El Salvador, almost 50% of the population, 45% of the population is in a risk area. So this is a very, very significant value. So that's why I brought one of the cases here that were recorded. This was an event that took place in 2015. It was the one that we evaluated. What was it? On Tuesday, yes, on Tuesday, that we chose and we said there were 15 people who had died, 260 people who had lost their homes, and over 2,000 people that had to be resettled. So this is a way in which we can share alert that opened up on the 23rd of April. And down to the 24th, there was an update here. You can see the hours and you can see it. And here, the civil defense already recorded some small landslide points, but nothing to compare with. And here, was okay, moderate, high. Then the rains went down a bit. And here, the alert for landslides was more moderate level, only that then the rain started and they went back to high. And so like that, 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 that that's the 24 hour follow up on the constant update. So 25th at 5 a.m. floods here, we open up for floods, see, and landslides. And here at 5 a.m landslides high, flood high. 10 minutes later, there was another update, and this was very high landslides. And then we found out through the news that two hours later, already six people had died because of the landslides. And then this information was obtained in the afternoon through Senad, when we already had some info. So rain continued, people were evacuated, and that's one example of how we managed to send out an alert early. But it didn't reach the population in time, right? So civil defense received the info, and they didn't know. So when we sent out the warning or the alert, we signify where the areas are, so where the event was going to take place. And if you can see here, these are the stations and these are the areas where the landslides took place. The issue is that it was 5 a.m., you know. It's hard to get people moving at that time. So. That was something that we were able to foresee, as I have just said, but it wasn't satisfactory because we couldn't avoid fatalities. So there was lots of action going on. People wanted to know whether we had given warning. So the ministries came to us. We were questioned. So we wanted to show that timeline. We did have the info. We sent out the info, but civil defense didn't have the proper structure. I don't know now. Maybe Tiago later can better explain 
how this works. Now, this shows you what happened. In El Salvador, the situation is really, really hard. And here you can see another event, floods. It took place at the Estrella Municipality, Taquari River. And the alert was started out on October 17, 2016, updated on the 18th early hours of the morning, and then it was considered very high, and then the were over flooded. So level of alert, high probability of occurrence. Despite this high alert was close to the overflowing moment, they were able to get ready to face the situation. And this is the graph. We were doing this follow-up, monitoring like this. At this point, we raised the alert. And here, this is the event. This is the flooding, the overflowing, went down. Here, over this period, people managed to leave home, and the level reached this. 2,401, and here you see the pictures, 24 people lost their home, 40 were evacuated, and over 1,000 families left their house just as a precaution. You have 770 municipalities affected by the flood. But the things we do not do any moni overall monitoring, we just monitor areas, a few areas. And you can see the news here as well, the headlines. It was a, a big flood. This is a quick overview. So we started doing our work in 2011. We see the number of municipalities that we are now monitoring or that we have been monitoring. You see the number has been on the increase throughout the years. And here you see this is very high. Yeah, certainty for high and very high. Moderate is, I mean, you don't think that's going to happen. So. We only take into account high and very high. 56 municipalities in 2011, so everything was 100% because of the certainty. And our alert rate was 100%. 2012 figures went down because there was a sharp increase in the number of municipalities. See, operators were, I mean, were sort of unable, were at a loss. In 2013, you see more municipalities and higher rates. 2014, a sharp drop because another sharp increase in the number of municipalities. But as I said, in 2011, we had few operators or were temporary workers, I would say. Yeah? Uh, they were sort of part time workers. Here in 2014, we hire full-time operators. That was a very meaningful change. We did this change in October, November, at the beginning of the rainy season. This, and this really affected us, because all the new hires were not really well prepared. They were not properly trained to do the job. So it was a very hard year for us. But you can see then, 2015, 16, and 17, uh, our rates improved considerably. This is another example of occurrences. That's orange color landslides, Hy hydrological risk. And here, the alerts that have been issued. You see, you have more here on the coast. You have here in the north, in the Amazon forest. Yeah, you see, n no alerts there. Do you remember the map I've shown you? There's practically nothing there. I mean, no s station for measuring rainfall. It's a very remote area, difficult access. So it's very difficult to collect rain data. Now we 
we are installing new equipment, but I don't think that's going to be enough. So I'm afraid we have some misses there in the north. And how can I say that? There was a special condition. You know, there's a combination of th things there, a lot of rain as well. You had more people in one region. And the floods come, I mean, take longer to arrive. No problem there. So Brazil is a very big country. But anyway, we are improving now. As I said yesterday, apart from these short-term events, yeah, short-lived events, you have those events caused by drought. I said in 2014, you hear at the bottom, this is one of the water reservoirs in the Cantarera Basin. In 2014, there was a high risk of water shortage. We practically had to start rationing water. Look here. These are the flows, average flows. Minimum, in, according to historic data, and this is 2014, you see? Well below, well below the average. That there was an extreme situation, extreme drought. Yeah, we were very concerned. And here you see the situation. Look. Look at the ground, and what happened? You see the red line? That's water reservoirs. We had three main reservoirs, and they collect water. We started monitoring. The level was here. And this is the volume of water stored. Sorry, it's in Portuguese. I did not have time to translate it. And here you see the amount of water, and you see some peaks. This one here and this one. What happened there? They had to use what we call the dead volume. That's the water below the line. In, I mean, in that case, where you can use gravity to extract water. So that was a very difficult situation. What did they want then? They wanted to know what was what's going to happen. Yeah, well in advance they wanted the information, but it was impossible for us to get a forecast for this. So we start doing this work based on scenarios with different rainfall scenarios and different demand scenarios. In March 2014, I included this conclusion, and this was the message for authorities, for the reservoir to reach a good level of water, that demand should go down to 18 cubic meters per second, because the current value was 33. They needed a sharp decrease. We sent out this message to authorities, the company's CEO. You know, this company deals with water management. And you know, this was March. This is a simulation. <clears throat> and then we did this on May 23rd. You see, you see the number, yeah, very high, 24 cubic meters. Demand remained very high. And well, do you remember the World Cup, the Football World Cup? Well, that was the moment. And no one wanted to have a water shortage. And obviously, <clears throat> they had to stop pumping water and they had to start extracting water without using gravity. But anyone heard about this? Well, no one, because they, the pumps, the water pumps had already been installed. So we made the decision. We are sending out alerts to authorities. No one did a thing. No one made a single decision. No precaution. So we decided to start publishing news, and we sent this information to the company. We started uh, publishing our reports, our conclusions, the possible consequences. And that's one of the things we started doing. We started doing, yeah, not only reaching authorities. Here, that's what I described before. You see the different scenarios. Yeah, remember that I spoke about gravity extraction and pumped water. 
we took that into account as well. And they wanted to know when the amount of water would go back to normal. So we kept doing some work, working on projections, and you know, we had some rainfall above average, and we reached this period. We were able to forecast. Uh, so you will go up that uh, line in 2015, end of 2015. So even if this is a model, and the model has shortages and shortcomings, there are other variables that we were unable to control. And this is just a quick example. Oh, 10 minutes? Oh, that's for Tiago, yeah. OK. So I'm about to finish then. What you can see is, is the different scales for our work. And here, we don't have the operators. You know, those working on this are researchers, us researchers. Even if we do research, we have to do some operational work. It's not just doing research. Sometimes we have to do this type of applied science. Now I will give the floor to Tiago, who will try to wrap up.